But today, uh, we are in the book of Proverbs, and we're going to talk about an unpopular subject. I think it's a little unpopular. Maybe it is popular for you. I hope it's not. Um, It's the issue of conflict, right? Uh, I'll tell you, when I started in leadership, I thought that the goal of leadership was to to turn off all the fires, right? So when you're leading a group of people, there's always going to be conflict. I mean, from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, uh, you say, well, they really weren't in conflict. Well, they kind of were in conflict. Once they got caught in their sin, they started, you know, pointing fingers at one another. No, and uh, so, so there was conflict since Adam and Eve. Then we see it also with Cain and Abel. We see conflict. Uh, and to present day, we see conflict. Anytime you have uh, two, uh, at least two people, there's the potential for conflict. There's a, and it doesn't even matter how much they love each other. Like, they could be madly in love with each other, and there can still be conflict. Uh, if you're married, do not say amen, but you know that this is true, right? Um, as many as two people, there could be conflict. So conflict is inevitable in life. We're always going to have it. We'll find conflict, I don't know, uh, at work. We'll find conflict at school. Uh, We can find conflict maybe at the gym or or, or maybe a social club that we're a part of. We could always find conflict even in the church. There's conflict. I've learned that the, the goal of a leader isn't necessarily to turn off all the fires and to stop all the fires. Uh, and I'll explain this. I believe that the goal of leadership, of good leadership, is actually to manage fires. Uh, it's not about ending all the conflicts, but it's about managing the conflicts. Some conflicts, it's okay for you to leave those conflicts lingering. Now, I know that doesn't sound right, but let me explain what I mean. Think about fire. Fire itself. Fire itself is destructive. Uh, But, and if there's a fire in your house, chances are you're going to do everything in your power to fight against that power. You'll get a fire extinguisher or you'll try to get buckets of water to, to end that fire. But you know this to be a fact. There are some fires in your house that you allow, right? There are some fires. The stove, for example. That's a fire that you say, well, I can allow that fire, and it's a good thing I need that fire to cook my meal. And, and the problem there, is, well, I'm sorry, not the problem. The issue there is that you're okay with that fire. Why? Because it's controlled. It's managed. So that fire is okay, and you'll let it burn. Uh, it's managed. Uh, another place you might let fire, maybe uh, you're like my wife and you love scented candles and you might want to turn on a candle and you want to, the only way to have a candle uh, is by lighting uh, it up with fire. And you might say, well, that is a good fire. It's okay because it's contained, it's managed. Maybe you're blessed enough to have a fireplace at home and you're okay with that fire because it's managed, it's controlled. In leadership, I've found that it's not about turning off all the fires, but rather it's about managing the fires. Because the truth is, is that if we turned off every single fire, we might be left without a church. Like we, we got to make sure that we manage the fires. There are some fires that you want to make sure you shut off, right? If it's out of control, then you manage it and you say, well, we got to turn this fire out because it's bigger than what we can control. But the truth is, is that there's always going to be something um, or at least the potential for something. At your job, there is always the potential for something. There's always something that can be going on, uh, in my opinion, I say this respectfully because I know we have some great leaders here, but respectfully, in my leadership opinion, I believe that you manage the fires, you don't have to turn off every fire. Not every fire really needs our attention like that. Um, Not that every fire is good because every fire has the potential of burning further but as long as you can control a fire, manage a fire, then it's okay. So today we want to talk about not how Pastor Rob handles conflict, but how do the wise handle conflict? Uh, The Bible has something to say about that. Uh, Proverbs has much to say about that, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, The first thing you should know is that the wise handle conflicts with patience, with patience. 
Now let's talk about patience for a moment. What is patience? It's a word we hear a lot. It's, a, it's something that we, many of us say we don't have a lot of. I don't have a lot of patience. If we are from the Northeast, uh, we don't have a lot of patience. I'll tell you a story. I, went, uh, I, was, going, I was moving to Missouri um, because I was going to go study down there. So I went to kind of check out the place, see what it was like, go to visit the school and everything. And when I went to Missouri, I'll never forget this experience. It was so funny. Um, I went there. I said, oh, I need to get a haircut. Uh, I, I wasn't, you know, in shape to be seen by people. I said, I need a haircut. So I go into, I hop into a Great Clips there, and I'm like, okay, Great Clips seems safe. Let me just go there. Uh, I go to Great Clips in Springfield, Missouri, and I'll never forget uh, the lady's cutting my hair, and uh, I, I'm telling her, hey, where, you know, where are you from? Um, oh, she's asking me. I said, oh, I'm, I'm from New Jersey. I, I think she heard the accent, because uh, there they say I have an accent, but I don't have an accent. Uh, but when I went there, she, she tells me, uh, where are you from? And, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, and oh, she goes, oh, that's great. She goes, oh, I, I was from that area. I lived in New York also. And oh, I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, so we're talking. We have something in common. She's cutting my hair. She goes, oh, but I moved here several years ago. And the pace of life here is so much better than Jersey. It's just so crazy out there, so fast-paced. And I'm just happy to be here, right? So she's cutting my hair um, slowly, by the way, I might add. Uh, so she is kind of... Uh, so so I am in a little bit of a rush because I'm from New Jersey. I don't have the same pace that she has. So, you know, we're talking about that. And by the way, while she's talking about the pace, I'm not really feeling it. I'm like, we're not, we're not fast. It's just you're slow. Like, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. But she cuts my hair. She's done cutting my hair. And uh, she, you know, I pay her. I, I, I think the, the haircut was like $15 or something. So I pull out, you know, a 20. Uh, I tipped her. Don't, don't take these numbers. I do tip my, my, uh, my people, but uh, whatever. I, I gave her, so she owed me change, right? But before she can give me the change, I was already, oh, I was already halfway out of the door. <laughs> like, and, then, and then she goes, hey, uh, your change. And I look at her, and I said, oh my gosh, I forgot. And she responds to me. She says, you see? <laughs> like, she's telling me, you see how fast-paced you guys are? You can't even wait for your own change. So patience, I've heard, we're not very good at uh, patience here in the Northeast. But what is patience? Because we say we don't have it, we talk about it, we say, sometimes we say we want it. Um, what is patience? I'm going to tell you what patience is. I'm going to try to define it as simply as I can. I believe that patience is simply uh, the inability to suffer for a long time. I'll say that again. It's the inability to suffer for a long time, right? Um, and when the Bible tells us that we need patience, we don't want patience because we realize that, that, the, that God, what he's going to try to do with us is that he's going to try to increase our patience with what? Suffering. Right? Because the longer you can suffer, then the more patient you are. So by that definition, I agree, I am not very patient. Um, you might agree also and say, you're not very patient. Uh, you might say, I'm not very patient. I don't like a lot of suffering. I don't like to suffer long. Right? Um, and, and that's what patience is. It's all about, it's about that, that, that long uh, period of time where you're extending the suffering. So the longer you suffer, the more patient you are. When it comes to conflict, what do we all want? No conflict. So we don't want to suffer in conflict. We don't want to have issues. We want peace. And we've spoken about that before. We want peace. I don't want conflict. I want peace. So that's why when it comes to conflict, typically we want to deal with conflict right away. You nip that in the bud, like right away. You don't want it to get out of hand. However, the wise handle conflicts with patience. They allow for some time to pass. They give the, themselves some time. They don't respond in the moment to conflict. This is what Solomon tells us. Whoever is patient has great understanding. But one who is quick-tempered displays folly. 
He's saying if you respond quickly to problems, you're going to demonstrate folly. You're going to demonstrate foolishness. It is not a wise thing to respond to conflict quickly, but rather to take your time. Take your time. Consider the conflict. Consider, does this conflict really merit my attention? That's a question that we must ask. Does this conflict, how do I go about responding to this conflict? Because if we don't handle the conflicts correctly, we could make a bad situation worse. In fact, he goes on to tell us a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. They make their bad situation worse. But the one who is patient, he can calm the quarrel. What's the issue? Let's, let's, let's look at it calmly. Let's take some time and think about it. Why, why is patience so good? I'll give you at least two reasons why patience is so good. Number one, um, because God rewards patience. If you read through scripture, you'll see that, that God has rewards for the patient. The patient are rewarded for their waiting. When you wait upon the Lord, you will be rewarded. When you give God time for his wrath, um, God acts and you are then rewarded. There, there's a reward. That's one reason why patience is such a good thing. There's another reason. The other reason is that it shows us the very character of God. Think about who God is and how God works with us. The Bible tells us that God is patient with us, right? That, that he doesn't want any of us to be lost, but rather he is patient with us. How was he with the people of Israel? He was patient with them. He suffered long, the Bible tells us. His long suffering, in fact... When we read through scripture, we read about his long suffering and God is praised in scripture for his long suffering. How would you like it if God acted quickly with you? Think about it. Every time you sin, God acted quickly, like, you know, straight up, like, you know, some, some big lightning bolt, you know, you know you did wrong, boom, no. What does God do? God is patient with us. He's patient with us. When we're patient, we are demonstrating the character of God in our lives. Out of this series, I want to just make an aside here for a moment. Out of this series, I have a, a goal and an objective. My goal and objective is that we would be a church filled with wise people. Why? Because if we are Christians that are filled with wisdom, then we will be able to demonstrate to the world godly wisdom and what it looks like. And then we'll be able to enjoy what God says we could enjoy when we are wise. I want people to be able to look at you, to look at me, to look at us and say, what a wise people. And to be honest, I don't just want this for New York Church. I want this for Christians at large. I want every Christian to act with wisdom. How many times have we not acted with wisdom? And what happens? We discredit the name of God because we've acted in foolishness. But when we act in wisdom, we bring glory to God. So out of this entire time, I'm hoping that you're just not listening to messages, but that you're saying, listen, I want to take this. I want to I wanna live it out. I want to be a patient person when it comes to conflict handling. I want to be patient. Why? So that I can bring glory to God. I don't want to be the hot-tempered, the quick-tempered, the one that got uh, put on social media because someone recorded me in that moment of weakness. That's not who I want to be. I want to be a person that looks, uh, that, that, that shows what God looks like if God were here. A lot of people, it's been said, a lot of people aren't going to read the Bible, but they will read our lives. So how do we handle conflict? Let's be patient. Let's be patient. The second thing we do right along with it is that the wise are quick to listen, but slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And James says it this way. He says, my dear brothers... And sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. How many of us are the exact opposite? Don't raise your hands, but how many of us are the exact opposite? I am 
uh, slow to listen, <laughs> like, like, right? No, uh, I am slow to listen. I am quick to speak, and I tend to be uh, fast to become angry. Like that, that is like our human nature. Uh, that's kind of where we want to go with this, right? I want to listen. I want to act now, listen tomorrow. Like that's the way I want to do it. That's the way many of us want to do it. Solomon says in Proverbs, he says, to answer before listening, listening, that is folly and shame. Have you ever seen, or maybe you've been in these arguments, but have you ever seen two people that aren't listening to one another, they're arguing, and they're both arguing for the same side? <laughs> they're both saying the same thing using different words, but yet they're mad at each other. It's like, no, you both actually agree. And it's like, oh, we agree. But, but here's the thing. Sometimes, many times, in fact, we listen late. So he says to to, to answer before you've listened, before you understand an issue, to answer to that issue, it's folly and it's shame. Sometimes we do well by just simply taking a moment and, and, and trying to examine and let's think about this issue before I have an answer. This is often, it's what sometimes gets us in trouble, even politically, right? Because we, we act like we know so much, and then there's information we don't know that other people know, and, and, and then we, we start saying, no, no, this is the way it should be. And, and, and have you yet really understood the entirety of the problem? And if we haven't, um, then, then it could be an issue. Then it could be an issue because we demonstrate folly and shame when we don't understand it. And he says to answer it, before you understand it is a problem. We can all attest to times when we thought something was one way and we heard this story. Person A gave us their version of the story and we heard it and then person B comes and sheds light on the missing parts of person A's story and then we see the story here and now we get it all together and we're like, wait a minute, it wasn't quite like this. And we've heard it said that, that people will say, well, um, there's always, there's always her side, his side, and the truth, right? I don't always agree with that statement because I do believe some people can be victimized. I do believe that one person could be completely lying, one person could be completely telling the truth. Like, I, I believe that. But, but the idea behind that statement is that, that there's, you know, like when you get the full picture, that's when you get the understanding, that's when you know that you've listened, and then it can be appropriate for you to respond. But it takes us understanding first. Solomon tells us a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. A fool doesn't want to hear your side. A fool doesn't want to hear the, the other person's side. All they want to do is explain and express their opinion and their opinion and their opinion. Well, James says, no, 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 take time, listen, understand the problem before you respond to the problem and make sure you have an understanding. I, I found that some people don't even know what they're arguing. Some people don't even know what they're arguing. Like, they can be arguing against you and not really understand their position. I find that sometimes I should just ask them, what do you mean by that? I feel like sometimes I should just ask, what made you feel this way? Like, sometimes you just need some understanding. Like, like help me understand why you feel the way you do. Help me understand why you took the action you do. You did, right? Why did you take that action? And sometimes in just asking those questions, sometimes we may, we may say, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. I didn't know that. And because I didn't know that, I thought this. But good, I'm glad you told me this. But, but there have been times when I've argued with someone and said, hey, explain to me like, why you felt the way you felt. Explain to me why you did what you did. Explain to me why you feel the way you feel. Explain it to me. And sometimes in just allowing them to speak that out, sometimes you're actually graciously allowing the person to just process the entire thing so that they can finally come out and say, this is what it is. Because we have another issue. The other issue is that sometimes we understand our emotions, but we just don't know how to express them. 
And, 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 and rather than arguing with someone, why don't you seek understanding? Why don't you ask them more questions? Find out more. Like, why, why do you think like that? Do you not realize this? Do you know this? Do you, and make sure that they understand their position. Look, you should be able, before you respond, in my opinion, you should be able to argue the person's position, even if they're wrong, you should be able to argue their position for them. And until you can do that, maybe you're not ready to respond just yet. It would be so much better if we understood, we took time to listen. The Bible tells us that sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent, what do they do? They hold their tongues, hold their tongues. And this is not just, I'm dying to tell you off, but this is more like, I wanna, I wanna take time, I wanna refrain my tongue so that I can be a better listener. Did you know that we listen better when we speak less? Who knew, right? We listen better when we speak less. Proverbs tells us, no, you, you hold your tongue. Otherwise, there's a potential for more sin. There's a potential for more sin. I'll share just a couple more. Uh, And and, uh, Abraham Lincoln actually took from this, I believe. The Bible tells us that the one who has knowledge uses words with what? Restraint. Restraint. I love it when I discover how smart and brilliant someone is, not because they told me how smart and brilliant they were, but just because I've learned this is a person that knows how to hold their tongue. So one who has knowledge uses words carefully. They use them with restraint. And whoever has understanding is what? Even tempered. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. You can even be thought of as wise. I love the way Abraham Lincoln put it, though. This is great. He says, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. Holding our tongues, listening, becoming better listeners. So we discovered we treat matters with patience. We're patient. We treat matters with good listening. We listen more. We talk less. So you're thinking, so is there ever a time to respond and say some words? The good news is that, yes, there is. But the way in which we do it makes all the difference in the world. The wise respond not with harsh words, but they respond with gentleness. They respond with gentleness. He tells us a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Um, you know, I, I've been having conversations with people where um, maybe I said some harsh words. Uh, and let me tell you, there's a difference, I believe, between you saying something harsh that you didn't intend for it to be harsh, right? Because maybe the person just received it that way. Um, I, I believe that some people, on the other hand, know their harsh words and use them anyway. <laughs> like, some people, I feel like they know the right buttons to press, and they just want to get a rise out of you, and they'll go for those words. They'll say the one thing that, that, uh, that, you know, that's the one thing. If you say that one thing, you know, the Bible tells us, listen, we want to turn away wrath. We don't want to stir it up. We don't want to use harsh words. Uh, we need to be careful. And by the way, everything I'm speaking here, uh, I don't want you to think about this as being uh, something that is for, uh, for world leaders, although some of this could apply. I'm talking about in a personal, right? I'm talking about you, me, other people. Uh, we need to learn to just speak with a more gentle attitude, right? The Bible tells us that the power of life and death are in the tongue. The tongue has the power of life and death. You can give someone life and encourage someone, or you can completely discourage them. And it's all in the power of your tongue. And you might say, oh, people are just, they're so sensitive these days. And I've said that once or twice. People don't say, you can't say nothing anymore. And then maybe some of that is true. But when you're in a conflict, how are you using your tongue? You know, the, the Bible tells us so much more about the tongue. 
right? How we ought to use the tongue. Colossians, I love the way it says it. It says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. From a biblical perspective, we handle people with gentleness. That is, that's a fruit of the Spirit, by the way, with gentleness. And we can do that, by the way, when we're not quick-tempered. When we've given ourselves some time to process, to think through things, to ask the right questions, to understand the issue as best we can, at that point, I believe, then we can respond appropriately. We can respond with gentleness. But I believe that those first two steps need to go first. I think we, we need to be committed to patience. We need to be committed to that. I'm going to be patient. As soon as the conflict comes, I'm going to be patient with the conflict. Could you imagine? Look, I could probably be that type of dad, but could you imagine if the father in the house was always trying to put out every fire in the house? You'd never be able to cook. I mean, you'd never be able to do anything. Like you turn on a certain car, oh, oh, no, no, no. We are patient. We, we, we think about it. We, we wonder what is going on. We think about it. We understand the issue. After we've understood it fully, then we respond. And we respond in gentleness. By that point, I think God will give us the right words. And I will say this, because some people avoid conflict like a plague. I don't believe that either. I don't believe that God will have us avoid conflict. And oftentimes what happens even in churches, what creates a lot of unhealth in churches is that we sweep a lot of things under the rug. What happens a lot in relationships and of marriages is that we sweep a lot of stuff under the rug and all that hurt, all that pain, what did we do with it? We swept it under the rug. Well, what happens? At some point, that stuff comes out from underneath the rug. At some point, there's no more space underneath the rug. But... If we handle things the way that God is saying to handle it, I believe that we will have success. I believe that we will be a great people. I believe that God will be able to shine his glory in the way that we live our lives. So, how are you handling conflict? Don't answer these questions out loud, please. Are you avoiding it like the plague? You're like, nope, I don't want to I don't want to deal with conflict at all. Like I I just avoid conflict. When people do things to me, I just never say anything. I just bottle it up inside and and man, don't please don't do that cuz you're a a ticking time bomb and then one minute somebody says hello. What do you mean hello? Like whoa, like I you know like slow down killer. Like you know like we need to not bottle things in. We need to deal with things, but, but at their right time, at their proper season, in the right way, the right manner. We need to be able to handle these things in a way that's god- godly. So please don't, don't avoid conflict. The Bible actually tells us that if your brother sins against you, what does the Bible say? It doesn't say bottle it up inside and never say anything. If your brother sins against you, you just leave it in there, uh, become passive aggressive toward your brother. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, no, if your brother sins against you, you go and you talk to them, right? And, And the hope is what? To win your brother over or your sister, like to win them over. And and the hope is always reconciliation and restoration. So don't avoid conflict. But are you dealing with it in patience or are you being impatient? Are, are you saying, no, I need to deal with this now and, and this is the way it's going to go and, and I'm going to be fast. Nobody messes with me. No, let's be patient. Are we listening? Are we listening? Do we understand? I'm not saying that we agree. I'm just saying, do we understand? Do we understand their position? Their position may be completely wrong. But do we understand it? Could we argue for them if we needed to argue for them? And ultimately, are we responding in gentleness? You know, that is really what's going to make for more successful households. It's going to make for more success at the workplace. It's going to make for more success in your church, in your country club, wherever you go. That's really what's going to help us. That's what's going to help us be wise. I always try to bring something, or I try to bring something that will really embed into your brains what I'm really trying to convey at the end of the day. And um, 
All that I can think about while I was preparing this message was this guy right here. Does anybody know who that is? You probably know who he is. This kid became uh, uber famous. Uh, it was a video that some years back, this little kid right here is arguing with his mom, and what is he saying the whole time? Listen, Linda, listen, 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 Linda, listen. I'm not taking his side of the argument because he was wrong, <laughs> but the next time that, that conflict arises in your life, I want you to remember this child right here. Just telling you, listen, Linda, listen, listen, Linda, listen, listen, Linda, listen. You know, if this image pops up into your head the next time there's a conflict, please let me know. And, because I, I, I'm just going to laugh so hard at that, but, but, but honestly, it would really bless you to hear this little child telling you, listen, listen, just just listen. Just take some time. Listen, Linda. Listen. We need to be patient in handling conflict. We need to be listening in handling conflict. And we need to be gentle in handling conflict. When we do that, we're going to handle conflict the way that the wise handle conflict. And you know what? That's not going to just bring glory to you. People are going to think that you're amazing for it. They really are. They're going to be like, man, what wisdom right? But it's not just about you. It's about your testimony. It's about how we represent Christ at our workplaces, in our churches, at our country club, at the gym, at the grocery store. Man, if we were more patient, if we were listening, and if we were gentle, it would make a difference. And you know what? The next time you go to tell somebody about Jesus, they'll want to listen. They'll want to hear what you have to say. But on the other hand, if we're not patient, if we're not good listeners, if we're always using harsh words, we're gonna discredit the name of Jesus and no one is going to wanna hear our testimony about him. Amen? Let's pray.